This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started in about two minutes. Talking about the CD. Good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock. We're going to get started learning about the closing disclosure. I'm very excited for this presentation because I, I don't have a PowerPoint. I actually have a closing disclosure that we're going to go through. Um, looking forward to it. The way we're going to do this now is uh, I've got the chat up and I've got the video up. If you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and shout them out or you can type it into the chat. Uh, just a little disclaimer, of course, I am an attorney and I do real estate closings for a living, but I'm not providing legal advice today and attorney-client relationship doesn't apply. Um, having said that, if you have specific questions, let's, uh, you can ask them as we go through the, the closing disclosure and I'm happy to answer them and we will uh, stay on as long as we need to get everybody's questions answered to get through this document. So I want to dive right into the CD and start explaining a few things. Um, this, as you can see on your screen, uh, sh shake your head or say yes. Can you see the CD, the closing disclosure? Okay, good. If you see if you shake your head, yes. So this is the document that discloses the fees the costs, the prorations to the buyer uh, from the lender on, um, uh, in a format prescribed by the federal government. So I will say off the bat, this is not the document that's used for disbursement. The closer document that's used for disbursement is the Alta two column settlement statement. Uh, the reason being that there are a few things we'll talk about in here related to mostly to title insurance that are not adequately disclosed on the closing disclosure. Thank you to our friends at the Consumer Financial Pr Protection Bureau. So let's just dive right into the document and talk about the parts. Um, as you can see, this is a statement of final loan terms. 
and closing costs. So this is the final settlement statement that has been negotiated, reviewed. It started off with a loan estimate from the lender, and then there was a preliminary closing disclosure that was prepared. And uh, that's give, we give those numbers to the lender. They combine it with their, with their fees and costs and deliver it to the borrower, along with a lot of other disclosures that they uh, ultimately re-sign for the second time at closing. But the closing disclosure, it gives us all the basic and pertinent information for the transaction right here at the top. You have the issue date, which I've highlighted here in the upper uh, left-hand corner. This is the date the CD was issued by the lender. As you know, there's a three-day waiting period that this, the buyer has to sign the CD, the closing disclosure, and then three days later, we can, we can close. That is, um, uh, um, three days is a misnomer. It can be as much as seven days if the uh, CD is physically mailed to the uh, to the borrower as opposed to signed electronically. I think everybody does electronically now. I've not seen a mailed CD in some time. So that, that means we have three days, three business days, by the way. Uh, Saturday counts as a business day, but Sunday and holidays do not. So the next thing on here, we have the closing date. And the disbursement date on this transaction, of course, those um, those uh, dates are the same, but they can be different. If you, for example, were signing uh, a mail away on a Friday and not dispersing until a Monday, then the disbursement date might be a day or, or three days after the closing date. Uh, just depend, depends on timing. Of course, as you have experienced probably in your transactions, the borrowers or the borrower or borrowers must sign their loan documents, specifically their promissory note and mortgage on the closing date. So when you get a mail away, you can have some timing issues uh, that would cause the disbursement date to be after the closing date. Next up, of course, is the settlement agency. That's me, Paradise Coast Title and Escrow. Our file number is next followed by the property address of the property being sold. And then of course the sale price, in this case, 345,000. Up next is the contact information for the borrower and the seller and the lender. Um, you'll note that a lot of times in your transactions, the sellers will sign a seller's closing disclosure, the seller CD. That seller CD doesn't contain all of the loan information over here that the, uh, that the borrower needs to know because it's none of the seller's business, the actual type of loan, the, the interest rate and all that sort of thing that uh, the borrower is getting. They just need to know, the seller just needs to know they're getting their closing. So moving right along through the CD, I'm, I'm gonna do this a little bit like I'm, like I'm in a closing and I'm talking to the borrower and walking them through this document. And, um, for those of you that have closed me before, you've seen this presentation a little bit, uh, but I'm gonna be more specific and talk about some of the things so that you as a realtor can answer questions of your, um, of your borrower or your seller when they see this document. So the next section coming down from the top of the loan terms, this is the loan amount, the interest rate and the principal and interest payment right here. These um, basic terms of the loan, Note, however, that the principal and interest rate is not the monthly payment. The monthly payment is disclosed down here in the projected payment section because it includes the estimated escrows for taxes and property insurance. If we had, a, if we had mortgage insurance payment on this loan, it would be in this blank right here. And um, we don't have a mortgage insurance payment listed on this particular CD. But before we get into that, going back to the loan terms, it also discloses whether there's a prepayment penalty or a balloon payment. Uh, in Florida, there are no prepayment penalties typically for consumer loan, for, for residential loans. And uh, most banks don't do balloon payments anymore. This, so you wouldn't see this very often. Moving right along, the projected payment section. 
So next up, we talk about the principal and interest plus the escrows. You can see here the estimated taxes, insurance, and assessments. I just put 350 a month so you can see where it goes. And this, this CD discloses that property taxes and homeowners insurance are included in escrow. And that's what this $354.41 right here is all about. Okay, the next section on page one includes the, talks about the costs of closing. The closing costs here, this 21,323.77 are the closing costs that our borrower is gonna pay at closing. And it lists what's included, the loan costs, the other costs and the lender credits. And then the cash to close, this bottom number, as we say at the bottom line, this is the number that the borrower is going to wire in for closing. So we tell the borrower to get their wire ready, this 21,514.96 number at the very bottom of page one is what we're talking about. Okay, before I move on to page two, does anybody have any questions about page one of the CD? Everybody's good? You understand what we're looking at here? Loan information, the basic terms, the projected payments and the costs at closing, okay? I don't see anybody entering anything into the chat and no one's unmuting, so let's keep going. So up next, we have page two. Page two, as it says, this is the details of the closing costs. This is where your loan, for, your loan charges go, your title charges, your government recording charges, your other charges. Um, uh, Lisa is asking, are you able to give us a list of items each party has to pay for? Lisa, we're going to do that right now. We're going to go through this and we're going to talk about who pays for what. So in here, in this first column, you've got the borrower paid costs and you've got the loan amount, or I'm sorry, the loan origination charges, including the points. You've got the processing fee that's typically to the loan broker and the underwriting fee typically to the loan broker. Then over here, these are all again paid by the borrower, the buyer. You've got your appraisal fee is paid outside of closing, but it still shows on your CDs so that we record that it was done. And then you've got your credit report fee, your flood cert fee. And in this case, there is a mortgage insurance premium to HUD housing and urban development, that's the, the federal agency. Uh, that's where this is disclosed. You can see here, typically it looks like they're paying a lot of points, 487463, that's 1.439 points to buy down their interest rate. And they're getting mortgage insurance to HUD because they're putting down less than 20%. Yes, somebody's a question. Elizabeth is asking, on one of the transactions, the lender is collecting, in fact, three months tax in advance, and this amount shows up in the closing statement. Is this correct? Elizabeth, that is exactly correct, and we're about to talk about it. It's down here in the, in the next section. Okay, so we get the, uh, the services that you can borrow or did not shop for. That's, that, that's what the lender just opposes on the borrower. Then we've got the services that the lender, that the borrower can shop for, and this is the title. So in my case, you know, Paradise Coast Title is doing the closing. We have a doc prep fee for the lender. Uh, we've got a title search fee. We've got the lender's endorsement. So the lender wants title insurance and they want certain things on the title insurance that are called endorsements. And those endorsements are for things like surveys or environmental issues or for the condominium or the homeowner association. In this case, the endorsements cost $305. Then you've got your lender's title insurance policy. So this is a not properly stated on the closing disclosure because Florida law controls the uh, payment of title insurance. And as many of you know, you, you buy an owner's title policy and then you get a simultaneous issue rate that is substantially discounted for the lender's policy. 
but the closing disclosure, uh, thanks to our friends in the federal government, doesn't show it that way. They show the full cost of a lender's policy, and then down below show the optional cost of the owner's policy that will be incrementally larger, incre the incremental difference um, for the owner's policy. It's not, it's not properly disclosed, but it is done according to federal law. And there's a different document called the Title Insurance uh, Premium Disclosure Worksheet that properly discloses this and shows the differences, um, which you may have seen if you sat in on a closing with your, with your borrower. And then now we have a settlement fee. Uh, of course, Paradise Coast Title and Escrow, we charge low flat fees and we don't charge any junk fees. So you don't see any costs in here for administrative charges or wires or transaction fees that, that uh, other closing agencies might charge. Uh, the seller, of course, being the person that has to clear title, um, they uh, also pay a closing fee because all the work really is on the seller side to make sure that marketable title passes. So all of this is added up and you get your loan costs right here, 15,233.81. That's this column added together. Uh, Lisa is asking about vacant land. Vacant land is very similar to this, although it's more difficult to get a loan lease on vacant land. So you may not have a CD for your closing. The next section, of course, are our friends of the state and uh, local government want to be paid. So you have recording charges and documentary stamp taxes and intangibles taxes. Uh, you can see here it costs $18.50 to record the deed. It costs $95 to record the mortgage. We report the total in the buyer's column, the borrower's column here. Then the documentary stamp taxes on the deed are about 99% of the time it's paid by the seller. That's at 70 cents per $100 of value. And that's, that's a seller cost over here. And then you've got your documentary stamp taxes for the mortgage right here, 1185.80. Uh, Amy is asking, yes, Amy, I have this set up for Collier County, but in, in Lee County, the or in uh, other parts of the state, the seller would pay title. Um, and you've got next up, you've got your intangibles tax on the note. This is two cents per thousand dollars of value. So you'll notice here, you've got two charges uh, that are on the buyer's side that are for for the recording of the mortgage and the note, a lot of people don't realize that this additional fees apply and are paid by the buyer. So be, be wary of that. And then now this is where it gets into a little bit tricky reading this. Uh, you've got your prepaid section up next. And I'll walk a buyer through this and make sure they understand the prepaids and the initial escrows kind of work together. So here in the top of the prepaid section, you've got your 1789. This is homeowner's insurance for this year. This is the 2022, uh, uh, where are we in March? March to 2023, March uh, homeowner's insurance. It's the current year's homeowner's insurance. But notice down here in section G, we're paying $149.08 a month for three months over here, 447.24 for more homeowners insurance. This is the start of paying for next year's homeowners insurance. This is the 2023-2024 payment, this 447.24, and we're collecting it into escrow. Remember on page one, we said that they're gonna pay property taxes and homeowners insurance into escrow. It's gonna be approximately $354 and 41 cents a month. Well, that is broken down here on page two into homeowners insurance at 149.08 and property taxes at 205.33 and it's an additional escrow cushioning is collected at closing. The next number you'll notice on here is this 519.68. That's the prepaid interest. People think when they get told, oh, my payment isn't until May 1st. 
Well, it's not free. You're paying the interest between the closing date and the first payment date on your closing disclosure. So it's, it's not a free month. It's just a month where you don't have to write a check, but you did pay the interest for that month from the closing date to the next payment date. Right? People get confused about that. Okay, so then we have our aggregate adjustment down here in the, in the initial escrow disclosures. This aggregate adjustment is a reduction in the closing cost to the buyer because the lender made a mistake from the loan estimate to the closing disclosure. They over-disclosed, or I'm sorry, under-disclosed on the loan estimate, and they have these tolerances that the federal government makes them check off and then once they go through that, they may owe the borrower some money back. And so that's what this number represents, it lowers the borrower's closing costs. Okay, then we get into this other section. This is where the other charges come in related to the closing. And you can see what we've got in here. We've got a lien search for $117. We have the realtor commissions. We have the surveys in here for $395. Then the transaction fees that the brokers charge either side would go in here. Utility payments go in here. This is the other section. This can include all of your homeowners, uh, capital contributions, your, your special assessments that are being paid off. Uh, anything else in the closing gets dumped into section H. And then, the, uh, then you've got your totals here. Your total closing cost is a 21,323.77. That's your subtotals minus your, your uh, lender credits and your payments outside of closing. And does anybody have any questions on page two before I move on to page three? Page two questions. Come on, somebody must have a question. I'm not that good. Okay. If everyone's comfortable, we'll move on to page three. So page three of the closing disclosure is the balance sheet of the transaction. You have this calculating cash to close section here at the top. This is just where you compare the loan estimate to the final CD and determine if anything changed from the loan estimate. Uh, typically, this is not a useful section of the CD because a lot changes. Um, but the lenders kind of fudge the way they do their loan estimates. So I don't typically go over this section with my borrowers. I think it's more important to talk about the summary of the transactions. So you can see who's paying for what and where and how much. And I like this section because it just breaks down the closing like a balance sheet. So the borrower's total all-in payment on the closing date is right here. Uh, 365,903.55 is the total that the borrower is going to bring into the transaction. That's their purchase price, plus their closing cost paid at closing, plus the credit that they're uh, giving to the seller for the garbage. Remember, the garbage bill is paid forward. So we, the seller has already paid the garbage bill for the fiscal year of October 1 to September 30th of the year. So they get some of that money back and that's listed right here in the adjustments paid for by seller in advance. Next up on the borrower side, we talk about the money that is being paid on behalf of the borrower that is already paid into closing. You've got their deposit that they've already paid here. The lender of course is sending in the lender funds. Uh, the seller is not giving a credit on this one. If it was, it'd be listed here next to seller credits. If there was, if there was any prorations for rents, if this was a rental property or other things, it'd be here under other credits. And then you get down here for items unpaid by the seller. These are the property taxes for 2022. Remember, property taxes are paid in arrears. You pay your property tax at the end of the year. So we don't know the 2022 taxes yet, but we do know that the buyer is gonna pay them and they're gonna be similar to the 2021 taxes according to the contract. 
So we use the 2021 taxes and we give the buyer a credit. That's the buyer gets money. They get a credit that reduces their cash to close. Um, in the amount in this case, $637.59, which is a daily proration of the taxes. And then that gives us, when we get to the bottom here, this is the money that, the, that they had to wire in for closing. You'll notice that the this number, this cash to close from bar, borrower is the same number as it was on page one of the CD under cash to close is broken down and laid out for the borrower to see. Okay, uh, Julie is asking, if it's a new construction, please clarify how taxes are calculated. Julie, the NABOR contract um, controls that how the tax are paid for new construction. If the new construction has not been accounted for yet in the tax bill, but was, was the construction was completed in the prior year, then you use 80% of the estimated value, which is typically the contract price, and you calculate the taxes manually. If the construction is going on in the current year, then you would simply prorate the land value because the construction costs are not yet accounted for. I know that's a little confusing, but that's what the NABOR contract says. Bob is asking, does real estate get this CD three days before closing to go over with the buyer? I mean, I assume you mean the agent, Bob. The contract says that the lender may disclose the CD to the agents, to everybody in the transaction, but they typically will only send it to the borrower and the borrower will need to contact me and I'll go over with them or they can contact you and you can go over with them. Okay. Um, Let's see, your lease says asking the buyer picks the title company on home or land and they pay for title policy. Not sure if it's vacant land, has a title policy. Uh, Lisa, pay, and I'll say this to everybody, paying for title is by custom. It's not a law in the state of Florida who pays. Uh, there is a federal law that suggests whoever picks the, uh, whoever pays for the title should pick for it, but that's not entirely clear. And the Namor contract says that the buyer picks the title company in all counties and the seller pays in Lee and Charlotte and the buyer pays in Collier. Those are just defaults. Those can all be modified. It just depends on the, the, what the parties are doing. And of course, if you have a commercial transaction, everything is up for negotiation. If you have a, if you have a construction contract, you'll notice that the buyer pays for everything, including the dock stamps, which is typically a seller cost. So it's all negotiable, it's all negotiated. Uh, the Namor contract and the Farbar contract just have defaults that you can adhere to or not. Okay, let's talk about the seller side of the CD. Um, over here, due to the seller at closing, this is what the seller is supposed to get as their gross number at closing. Uh, they uh, get a credit in this case for the garbage bill already paid, just like the, the buyer gave the credit, the seller gets the credit. So it increases their cost due at closing above the purchase price. Then of course, the seller has got closing cost expenses, including among other things, the commission. That's reflected right here. And then of course, they're giving a credit for property taxes that we discussed on the buyer side. So that reduces their closing costs. You can see that math is done down here. And the, the, this is the cash due to the seller is the 326.30.50. That's the seller's bottom line. Cindy is asking, in another class, we were told if taxes go up, the borrower can ask seller to prorate higher amount after closing. How does that work? Cindy, that's exactly correct. The contract contains a reproration provision. Once the tax bill comes out in November, if you uh, want to, the buyer or the seller can request the title company to rerun the proration numbers. And we do that for free. And then maybe the seller, typically the seller would owe the buyer some more money because taxes always go up. Very rare the taxes would go down. 
but you just call the title company, call me after November when the tax bill comes out and I'll rerun the numbers and give you an amount to ask the seller to pay. Uh, oh, any other questions about page three of the CD, the balance sheet here before I move on to the disclosure section? I have a question. Yes, Amy. Are the sellers obligated to make that payment on the taxes if, it does, if you didn't wind up the question? If you didn't what? If the buyer, if the taxes go up and the buyer requests for the seller to pay the difference and the title company gets involved and is the seller obligated to make that payment? Yeah, it's a contractual obligation that survives closing in both the FAR bar and the neighbor contracts. And I don't know of any title companies that don't um, have the seller and borrower sign the uh, uh, settlement statement addendum that contains another iteration of the reproration agreement. So it is, it is a continuing obligation of the seller and the buyer if they so choose to exercise it. Andy is asking if the seller pays for title, does the split the closing cost to the title company? Uh, Andy, it depends on the county and it depends on the title company. In Lee County, under my, for me, if the seller was paying for title, I would not charge the buyer necessarily a closing fee unless I was doing work for the buyer specifically uh, to their side. If they were getting a loan I, and I was processing the loan package, then I would charge the buyer a closing fee. Or if there was legal work that needed to be done for the buyer, like forming an LLC or a trust. But in this typical cash transaction where the seller pays title, I would not charge the buyer a closing fee in Lee County. In Collier County, you would, because the buyer pays for title. Other questions before I move on to disclosures? I have a question, Sam. Yes, um, Christina. As you're, thank you. As you're going through this, I don't know if you've got a, you know, more of a simplistic form that just has a breakdown, like buyer side, seller side. This is Collier. This is Lee. This is, you know, the 70 cents, just something that almost like a, you know, a remedial type of form so we can see who pays what, what can be negotiated and what the price is on, you know, doc stamps. A cheat I sheet. don't have a cheat sheet per se. I wish that's a great idea for me to try and make something up. Unfortunately, the, best our idea. the federal government um, chose to create this very complicated six page form that uh, doesn't really help a lot of people but I've got to follow the federal law. So this is what we go through. Tell me who I need to send flowers to in your office to create that cheat sheet, please. <laughs> uh, that'll be me. I'll work on it. All Thank right. You. Fruit bouquet coming your way. I love it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Anyone else wants to send a fruit bouquet? Yes, we will. We happily eat chocolate covered fruit in this office. <laughs> um, all right, let's talk about the disclosures. So people always say, you know, you know, define print. Well, this actually is a lot of useful and important information here on page four of the disclosure. Um, let's walk through the two columns going down the first column, whether the loan is assumable. This loan is not assumable. I actually get this question quite a bit, uh, particularly in a rising interest rate environment. It makes the, the deal more attractive if a person was going to sell and you could assume the low interest loan. Lenders, of course, are on to this and don't allow assumptions because they don't want you, they want the higher interest rate on the new loan. So in this case, the loan is not assumable, although it could be depending on the lender. Next up is the demand feature. This loan does not have a demand feature. The demand feature says that the lender can require a payment prior to when it's due in the promissory note in the typical course. They can call the note early is another way of saying that. And that's bad for borrowers who don't have a lot of cash. And I, I, frankly, I have not seen a demand feature in a note that was not a commercial transaction, a very complicated commercial transaction. So I would not expect you to see a demand feature in your note, in your promissory note. Late payment, of course, if the payment is more than 10 days late, there's a 5% penalty. That's standard in Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac style mortgages that are gonna be on the secondary market. 
Um, means what it says. If you're more than 10 days late, they apply the 5% penalty. And that's 5% of the payment, not the loan, 5% of the payment. So, you know, if you have a thousand dollar payment, you would owe uh, 50 bucks. Okay. Next up is the negative amortization feature. This loan does not have a negative amortization feature. Uh, negative amortization typically means that you're, when you make your monthly payment, you are not paying the full interest on the loan and the, and the uh, uh, loan is actually growing in value instead of being reduced in value. Uh, very bad, used only for high interest uh, flipper type loans that are definitely not typical. And these are the loans that got us in trouble back in the, uh, the good old days of 2008, 2007, five, six, seven, eight. These, these types of flipper loans are what caused the crash. So people don't do those anymore that I've seen. Partial payments is next. So some lenders will take a partial payment. They will, they will, you can't afford the full payment for the month. You pay a portion of it and it will be applied to the loan. Some lenders will hold the partial payment in a separate account. In this case, the lender is, does not accept partial payments. They will, um, return the money. Then it says here about you are granting a security interest in the property and you may lose the property if you don't make your payments or satisfy the other obligations of the loan, just making the borrower aware of their security interest. Next up, there's the escrow account, the impound or trust account it's called. This is the escrow account. Um, talks about the property escrows for the first year, the initial escrow payment and the monthly escrows that'll be on top of the uh, principal and interest. That's your PETA, principal interest taxes and insurance is your PETA payment, is, is your uh, monthly escrows plus, plus your principal and interest. Um, another disclaimer that the property cost may change and the escrow payment may go up or down. Make sure that you pay your property taxes. Uh, just a simple, another simple disclaimer, disclaimer. So before I move on, any questions about the disclosures? These are all pretty basic, pretty, pretty common. Okay, moving on to page five. Next up is the loan calculation. So this is a very important table that is very often overlooked. I'm guilty of overlooking it, uh, but this table tells you the total cost of your payments. So remember on page one, it was disclosed that I'm getting a loan for $338,751, but that's not how much I'm paying the lender for this loan. Here on the, I'm paying $547,612.80. For this loan, because I have to pay two hundred and eight thousand dollars of principal, and the financed amount—this is the amount that's actually being financed, less my closing costs—is the three twenty-five. Yes, Christina, do you have a question? I think she's. At least I think Christina the question was answered. And then you've got your APR. So this is the actual interest rate, the annual percentage rate that you are paying for the loan. So again, on page one, it was disclosed that I have an interest rate of three and a half percent, but that's not what I'm paying for the money. The cost of my money is actually 3.681% because I've got additional charges and costs and those are accounted for. And 38% of my loan payment is the additional interest paid over the principal. So people need to know the cost of their money. This is the cost of their money. It's very, I think this is a very important section that people will often overlook. Then you have your other disclosures. Uh, important here, state law does not protect you from liability for the unpaid balance. I think some states have some programs that might help. I'm sure there's something in California where you never have to pay your mortgage but <laughs> that's a California joke. Um, in Florida, if you don't pay your mortgage, you're gonna lose your property. 
And uh, that's not a joke. A lot of people found out the hard way in the, in, the, in the recession. And then the last part of this here is the contact information, which I did not include everybody's contact information, but it all is all disclosed here. You have the buyer's broker, the seller's broker, the settlement agency, the mortgage broker, and the lender, all their pertinent contact information, state licensing information is disclosed right here. And then of course, page six, the seller and buyer sign. Typically we don't have seller and buyer sign together. We have the seller sign, the seller CD, the buyer signs this CD, and then everybody signs the Alta settlement statement. And with that, that's the CD. Pretty uh, complicated, yet simple in some respects. And um, I am now gonna open the floor for questions generally about this or the contract. So does anybody have questions? Come on, you must have questions. And then Bob, does the seller get a CD if it's a cash sale? No, Bob, we would use the Ulta two column statement on a cash transaction or the traditional HUD statement on the transaction, we would, we would not use a CD in a cash sale. Other questions? Andy, if the seller credit to the buyer for some repairs, where does that number go? That's a great question. It goes right here. Andy, under uh, seller credits, if I can mark this up. Seller credits right here, right there. I don't have my, my comment on the panel. Where is it? I don't know. It's right, it's right there in L5, Andy. Um, let's see here. What does the buyer have to pay in a cash sale? Vicki, it depends on the county. Typically, the buyer will pay for title insurance in a cash sale. Um, and then the seller gets the settlement statement, Bob, as soon as it's ready. Uh, typically, once we get the estoppels in from the association, we can produce the seller side closing statement and get that off to the seller to review um, a few days before closing. We try in my office to get, get set up preliminary CDs out as quickly as possible so people can at least start getting an idea of their costs. And then we'll get final closing disclosures and HUD statements out once the estoppels come in. Uh, Jolene, 3% is very high. I would say 1%. Typically, the buyer and the seller in Collier County will pay 1%. In Lee County, the seller will pay about one and a half to one and three quarters percent. And the buyer would pay very little, if anything, and be prorations only. But, but Jolene, 3% is very high. Uh, in my case, here with getting a loan, I'm paying um, 20, uh, where is it? My closing costs are 20,000, 798.77 on a $345,000 purchase. Without doing the math, I can tell you that's, that's less than 1%. I'm sorry, <laughs> less than. By closing, I apologize, that was wrong. Let me, let me correct myself before I answer the next question. Oh, Jolene, you're saying all closing costs? Yes, with a lender involved about, yeah, 3% is, is plenty. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I, see that. I see that question there. But typically your, your title charges are gonna be um, about 1%, which is what it says right here. Three three one one nine is my title charges as on a th on a three hundred forty five thousand dollar purchase. So yeah, so everything with the lender is is three percent. That's fine. That's a fine estimate. Other questions? When you do the cheat sheet, could you show the differences in Lee County, please? So let me just say in terms of a cheat sheet, because I know some people want to see that. I'm about to come up with something. It's all negotiable. The, the closing costs are not set by statute. 
uh, there the buyer and the seller can each negotiate even though as a realtor you have standard forms and you're not supposed to deviate from the standard forms if you have a buyer that's like i'm not paying title uh, uh, i don't care if it's call your county we can adjust the form just give me a call we'll do an amendment or an addendum and we'll adjust the form so I, i'll try to come up with something but it doesn't get much better than the cd or the alpha settlement statement for disclosing Robin is asking, does the neighbor contract still have seller provide existing policy or paying 150? And why do we do this? Um, the reason for the 150 charge is that it makes life easier for the buyer if the seller produces their prior policy. And so this is an inducement to do that. I believe, and I, I have to remember, I don't know if anybody else from legal resources is on this call. I want to say that we made a change. And um, I don't think the 150 is going to be in the contract anymore, Robert. I think that's coming out. I'm trying to remember the last legal resources meeting. There was a lot going on. But I think it's coming out. I'll let everybody know. Andy is saying, can you talk about the reissue credit for the seller and where the number to go? So when the seller's title policy is less than three years old, then we can reduce the amount that the buyer pays for title insurance by a small percentage if the seller produces that title policy. That's another reason for the 150 uh, inducement that in, in, the old, in the old contract. Christina, I typically tell a seller to consider 2% for all closing costs and that'll be less. Is this what you just mentioned? Yeah, Chris, Christina, I would say 1% is plenty for closing costs. Unless you're getting a loan, then I would say 3% for the borrower. Okay, other questions? Don't want to hold you up if everybody's got them, all their questions answered. And you can always email or call me anytime. Let me put, because I don't have a PowerPoint this time, let me put my contact information in the chat for everybody. Or an email. Okay, um, Mike is asking why I send this format. Mike, this is just a sample CD. Uh, I was not intending to send this out. What I was gonna do is, is, is do the video link. Uh, so I will, I will get this up on my YouTube channel and send out a link to the video. Um, this is just a fake CD. So I wasn't planning to send it out, but thank you everybody for your time today. If you have any questions, I'm looking forward to them. Please feel free to um, call, email, text, chat, whatever you got. I'm available, FaceTime, whatever you need. Sam, um, I will talk to you all soon. Thank you. Sam. Oh, yes, Mona, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, There's nothing to do with this one. With the 1031, okay, you have, you have an investment. You sell it, you roll it in into another investment. You have to keep it for two years. What happened when you sell that new investment after two years? Do you, you still have taxes. to pay? You would pay the, you pay the tax in the time. Ten thirty ones are just a deferral of taxes, Mona. They're not. They don't. They don't get rid of them. They just defer them. So what? So let's talk about the Let's talk money. about that offline. I'll give you a quick call as soon as we're done here because that's okay. off topic. All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'll talk to you all soon. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.